They said it would take 40 minutes, but it actually took two and a quarter hours on the slab and you're awake. They punch a hole in your wrist and they stick wires up your arm into your heart. Also on the screen is your heart and suddenly it flatlined. <laughs> and I said, I said, I, t I said to the surgeon, I seem to have died. <laughs> and he turned around, looked at me in a very serious face and said, let me worry about that. Anyway, at the end, he did admit that my heart had stopped a couple of times. And also, one of the nurses, so she said to me, she said, I notice your name is Mr. Mr. Michael Dodd. And I said, yes. And she said, you're not the Mike Dodd, are you? That's the Potter. And I said, well, yes, I am. She said, oh, that's very exciting. I've got a couple of your pots. <laughs> well, essentially, uh, last year, I hardly potted at all because I, I didn't have any puff due to the fact that I've got blocking of all the arteries everywhere, including the heart. So the last show, yes. Clay is such an innocent thing, like nature. Nature's innocent. You know, there was an American potter who fired rifle bullets through his pots, you know. Well, it will show it up, you know, it will show anything that you do to it. Maybe similar to maybe a violin or a piano or something, you know, it doesn't matter. the slightest difference in the movement will show up something. And it's the same with clay. I'm being followed around by a cameraman. <laughs> this is a lovely little pot, look. It's from Czechoslovakia. It's one of my favourites. I think it is a new one. There's a few. I think the first time I contacted Clay was walking across a field when I was probably about 11 and it had been freshly ploughed and on one top of one of the furrows was this yellow colour which and I thought that was odd so I walked over and picked it up and a few more <laughs> you know you could actually squadge it in, in your hands and I kept it in my hands for I don't know couple of hours but uh, obviously the feeling was good when I was at school you had to choose to do some artistic endeavor and I chose well, I chose pottery the teacher Donald Potter very interesting had a name Potter but well he worked with Eric Gill for about eight years he had a good eye and he used to plonk pots about in the pottery on shelves and things. I unpacked the wood-fired kiln once, turned around and there was a cardio pot behind me and I suddenly understood something. I don't know what exactly, but visually something was opened up. And then at, at university I used to go and sit in front of pots in the, in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge and just soaked all that up. Yeah, no, I just loved them. And it didn't occur to me at that point to be, to go into pottery. It was only about the, in, in my second year, I think. And I suddenly thought, oh, I could be a potter. As soon as I had that sort of eureka moment at university, walking down the street, I wanted to be a potter. And uh, I didn't really have any doubts after that at all. And then I went to art college in London. I left uh, after a year because it wasn't, oh, I don't see any point in carrying on. Then about six months later, I found a tiny cottage in the middle of a field. And I went to see the farmer and he said, yeah, you can rent that. It was two pound 50 a week. And I built a kiln in the back, a wood fired kiln. I mean, I, in a way I was quite innocent of, of what it would involve. But if, if, you, if, you, if you're passionate about something, you just carry on, don't you? And learn as you go. I remember the first serious order I got from a, from a Mr. Smollett from London. And he saw some pots of mine in the local 
village post office window. And uh, he was down there on holidays and he popped in and he said, can you make me some cereal bowls? I said, well, I need a hundred of each, which was great. That which started me off. But then he used to come down every year and complain that people stole everything. <laughs> I said, well, you know, that's quite flattering really, isn't it? <laughs> My first show was in a shop in Brighton, near the theatre. Usually, the exhibitions in those days were about 80 pots. At the prime, people queued outside, waiting for the, you know, the gallery or shop to open for an exhibition. Of course, with Goldmark do it a bit differently, don't they, with 300 odd pots or more. And I knew I had a show coming up at Goldmark, so I thought, right, I have to make some more pots. I, I got stuck in in January. But it was hard work. I mean, everything physically is difficult, and I think even though I've got a stent, I'll probably need another one, I'd imagine, because it's getting worse again. And the firing was particularly difficult, and, my, and the local potter, Paul, Paul Stubbs, came round and, and helped me with that. Because I get very tired very quickly, and I was having to set the alarm to keep myself awake while the firing was going on. And then it just when it had finished and I'd unpacked and sorted out all the work for Goldmark, I thought, that's it. And it seemed very natural, it seemed a very natural ending. I'd run out of steam, because normally you're sort of there, present with the clay, and, you know, inspiration comes and or doesn't. But you're sort of more awake and I was more in pain than I was in in that so I, I knew that it was I sort of knew it was the last it was the ending but it seems very natural to me I just ran out of steam it's only reflecting life really I mean what we do is only a reflection of the majesty of life. Uh, we just try and get a liveliness in the work, which people respond to, or not. Yeah, that's what you do it for, because you're, you're trying to communicate your love of something. That's why you do it. If someone's got the same opening in their soul, or whatever you want to call it, they'll see the same. They'll, you know, they'll feel the same. Yeah, that's what art is. It's, a, well, in my opinion, it's a, it's communicating liveliness, life, in some form or another. Whether it's writing, pots, sculpture, music, opera, dance, it can be anything. When I was, had the pottery in Cornwall, there was a guy turned up who was a, who was a doctor. And he said, well, you trained as a doctor, didn't you? And I said, yes, I trained as a doctor. He said, he said well, I, I, can, I can get you back into, med, uh, in, in, into medicine. I said, I, I don't want to go into medicine. He said, why, why do you want to work with clay? You know, much better profession to do, be a doctor. And I, and I said, no, it's, it's lovely doing this. And I've never regretted uh, making pots and it's never been a regret at all. I've loved it. But I don't love it anymore because I, can't, I haven't got the energy to do it, you know. It's sort of the end of an era, really, in that there were um, a number of potters of Mike's sort of age who were influenced by the leech hamader business and i suppose now you are the last of them the last living entity the last living entity and it and it's actually nice to do this while you're still with us <laughs> rather than well just living you mean just living, living yeah. yeah the best expression of life isn't about me, isn't about ego. There was a Trappist monk called Thomas Merton who said, to the extent that you get out of the way, do you know truth? Basically, you've got to, you've got to look without baggage. 
because in the looking is, is life. You can't help look. When you open your eyes in the morning, you can't help but see. You know, it's already there. People call them the pots that sing. Some pot, you know. And you maybe get two or three, if you're lucky, half a dozen from a firing that really sing. So I try and keep the pots that sing to have a big, you know, to have a show. I know, I, invariably when you yeah. could, would buy pieces from other people's exhibitions. And you built quite a substantial collection. But a few years ago, Mike called me and said, I want to get rid of all these pots that I've been, I've been buying and accumulating over them. And will you handle it? And I said, yeah, fine. How much do you want for them? And he mentioned the figure, and I'm going to tell you, of, of 10,000. And then I said to Mike, OK, I'm ready to send you the, the cheque. And he then told me which charity to send it to. That's the essence of what this man is about. It is extraordinary, and you've lived your life that way. Um, you put many of us to, uh, to shame, really, uh, in terms of the way in which you have always felt treated living and kindness and generosity of spirit as more important than anything else. That generosity of spirit is in the work. And I think that when we take them, not as ornaments, but hopefully to actually hold and to handle and to use and to give away and to break, ideally without blinking, stick it in the bin, get another one. Um, that generosity of spirit comes back to us. I think it's an extraordinary thing. There are not enough of us who manage to do something which will give such enormous pleasure. We have been and are very privileged to work with people like you. But what I wanted to do was to say thank you because what you've made and what you've given the world will live on long after we are no longer here and will continue to give great pleasure. And for that, I thank you. It's just, you know, there are different, lots of different ways that humans can express, not, not their me, not their superficial stuff, but their vitality. That's all one is doing as an artist, is trying to get your vitality across in a communicable way. And pottery is one of them. That's it, really. That's my final word, my final chapter. <laughs>